In the grand design of God, the family is not a random occurrence, but a deliberate creation, a reflection of the profound love and wisdom of our Lord and Savior. The family, as designed by God, is a refuge in times of trouble, a source of strength in moments of weakness, and a sanctuary where individuals learn the true meaning of unconditional love. It is a haven where forgiveness is practiced, where grace is extended, and where the transformative power of God's love is evident in daily interactions and relationships. This is God's design for the family. A couple of years ago now, we moved out to the far reaches of Union County, out to the Marshville, Wingid area, bypass people, able to have a couple of acres. In the last couple of weeks, some trees have fallen over and need to be chainsawed and, and cut up. And so I began to do some chainsawing and realized my chainsaw was dull. And so I called my neighbor and I said, hey, where do you go around here to have your chainsaw sharpened? He said, well, I just sharpen it myself. I was like, okay. He said, but you might want to check the hardware store in Marshville. So I checked the hardware store in Marshville. I said, hey, do you do chainsaw sharpening? And they said, no, most people around here sharpen it themselves. I was starting to get the hint that their people there knew how to sharpen their chainsaw, and that's a skill that my dad never taught me to do. So I called some people up here in the suburbs, and they're like, well, you can go to the, the hardware store here in Matthews, and sure enough, here in the suburbs, you can get your chainsaw sharpened for $6 at Renfro's in downtown Matthews amongst the suburbanites. All of a sudden, I realized that people in Marshville area, they have been trained they, they know how to sharpen their chainsaw. I was never taught. I was never trained to do this, although I know how to use a chainsaw. We have two large trees that are now down. My younger son, Bray, and I will have some fun over the next couple of weeks chaining all these trees up. But I was never trained how to sharpen the saw. And as I go into today's message about raising godly men... I am well aware that many of us were never trained properly on what does the Bible say is a, a male, a man, and how do we raise men? Some of us didn't have a dad in the home. Others of us had a dad who was maybe absent. Others of us maybe had a dad, but there was no training. So we have a whole generation of males who are dads who don't know how to train up their sons into biblical Manhood, And we have a manhood male crisis. This is coming out here really uh, the last couple of weeks. Statistics have been gathered for years. I've used them before. They're getting worse. But right now today, 85% of males between the age of 18 and 24 don't even qualify to join the military. They can't even join the military. They're either out of shape. They can't get in shape. They have used illegal drugs or they're on so many other types of drugs that they can't even qualify. They have too many uh, convictions or they don't have a high school diploma. 85% of the males in America don't even qualify to go into the military. Is that a big deal? It's a big deal. The military is how you protect your country. You should be praying. We just got some, we just did some more bombing on Saturday. The military is an important deal. We don't have enough males who even qualify to have a strong army. We have a crisis, and we're going to speak to that a little bit. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you, that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up, and here's the word, the training and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the training. The word training here is a very specific word that Paul uses, and it means putting into the mind, putting into the mind, this idea of instruction and training. It really is the same word as has become popular the last couple of years of conditioning. 
our culture, our government, our schools are conditioning. It's the putting into the mind, the, the training, the conditioning. So what we're going to say today is, is that you and I, as parents, we have to put into the mind, train instructions on what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a male? Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 7 through 8, fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not ignore your mother's teaching. Again, I want to encourage you as we're going through this, listen to what we're saying. Listen to what the Bible's saying because we then want to take it and then be able to raise our kids because we are instructed to be the main trainers, the main teachers, and the guides, today specifically, of our boys who will that one day become men. Now, the focus of today's message in the few minutes that I have, I can't cover everything. So the focus is boys to men based on God's design Spiritual development is assumed in the message to be a high goal. I can't cover everything in one message. And so today I'm covering those things that I think are lacking, the things that have been misrepresented in our culture. I'm going to focus on those things, but absolutely the idea of spiritual maturity is the underlying uh, baseline for all of this. In a sense, I'm going to teach us to sharpen our parenting blades on things we haven't been taught and things we don't even know. We don't have a clue of what to do, many of us. Now, last week, we talked about husbands and wives and the roles. It's behind me on the screen. And we talked about these are the different ones. We walked through it. Well, today, we're going to look at protector, provider, and love, the lover. And if this is a man's role, then guess whose job it is to prepare the boys to be a man? So we're just going to use these three words. Next week's the girls. We're going to use those three words. We're just going to use these three words and walk through a, a sense of training, of instruction of what is happening. We should understand this is a long process. And for many of us, you need to understand, and this is true of all parenting, it takes quality time and quantity time, teachable lessons, walking with your boys, showing them, teaching them. You are absolutely going to condition them. You're going to put it into their mind. That doesn't happen on a few moments over here. It is spending time, quality and quantity time. You don't get to pick as a dad, as a mom. You don't get to pick. Well, I'm just going to have quality. No, no, you got to have both. And you got to figure out what needs to happen. So let's jump in. If one of the roles of the husband is to be the protector, then how do we raise men who are protectors? The protector, we are to raise strong, courageous, and confident men. Psalm 82 says this. Provide justice for the needy, and the fatherless uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and needy. Save them from the power of the wicked. This is a, a glimpse into not only what God does, but it's a glimpse into what the husband, when he has joined his life, the two become one, to the wife. This is the protector role. And so we're going to go to our boys when they are young and you begin. Listen, first thing, if you take a note, first thing, when they're young, you start telling them there is a difference between boys and girls. You are a boy. You will always be a boy. So I'm going to train you to be a boy. And in part of being a boy that becomes a man is that you are to have strength and you're to have courage. And you're gonna, you have this idea of confidence and you tell the two-year-old that and they're like, what? Just start the practicing, right? And then four and six and eight and all of a sudden now they've been hearing it and they've been hearing it and they've been hearing it. Part of it's just communicating the values of what we're supposed to be teaching and you teach strength. You teach its condition and you teach biblical strength. 
that it's okay to be masculine. It's okay to be a man, to be strong and courageous. You teach them to be just like Jesus said. Just like, just like Jesus said, yeah. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're like, blessed are the meek? Meek? Can't, I, I thought you wanted strong, confident. Absolutely. You know what that word meek means? It's strength under control. The farmers, the, the people in charge of the ranches, they would use this word meek for a stallion that at any point could jump out of the fence. But they now have made this stallion, this horse, had trained it to be meek, which is strength under control. I can jump the fence. I choose not to. And so men are to have strength. Boys are to have strength. And then we're going to teach them to have strength under control control, to raise strong, courageous, confident men. Now, there's some practical things you can do. I'm going to mention them uh, often as we go through this. And one's going to fall on the moms, especially, again, we talked about this last week. There are some who are single moms. We know it's not ideal, but some of us, that's what we're doing, right? So if a single mom, other mom if you're a mom, I'm going to give you a little phrase, assess before you caress. What does that mean? Assess before you caress. When the two-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, whatever, stumbles and falls, ah, before you jump in, check and see, are there any broken bones? Is there any blood gushing? Because you can actually condition them to have a sense of weak mind, like Pablo's dog, Pablo's dog, you can condition. Oh, when I fall down and scream, my mom comes. So all of a sudden, I become a screamer. All of a sudden, when I'm sliding into, into third as a third grader, and, ah, and I got tagged out, and I struck out, and I cry. All of a sudden, why do people cry when you strike out? Please. It's not because you're overcompetitive. We've raised kids who aren't mentally strong. So assess before. If your kid falls off the swing and breaks his arm and a bone sticking out, go and caress them. But assess before you caress, especially in those younger years. Why? Because you're going to train them to go, oh, that hurt, but not much. And really, the hurt, my mom didn't come rolling. If your kids play any kind of contact sport, they're, boy, they're going to have to be able to take a little pain without always being caressed. It starts at a younger age. Strong mentally. We have to raise a generation. We have raised a generation, just true, of weak-minded boys. We've gone from, when I was in middle school, from sticks and stones, we've transitioned into triggered and safe zones. And so I want to go back. I want us to go back to telling our kids, someone says something to you, you get mentally tough and you say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names and words and making fun of, it doesn't kill me. So I'm going to process and you're going to help them process. You don't need a safe zone and you don't need to be triggered every time someone says something. If it's just a mental sense, some of you right now that just triggered you because it goes against everything you're hearing. I'm just telling you. Not only have I been doing this a long time, I've seen a lot, I've seen thousands in my years of high school boys that were middle school boys that were elementary. Listen, we have to raise strong, courageous, mentally strong boys. And part of it will be, yes, you know what? Bullying didn't just all of a sudden start in the 2000s. It's always been there. There's always, especially with boys, there's a jockeying for position. There's a measuring up. That's just being a boy. So you train them. When you go to this locker room, when you go to fifth grade, boys are going to be boys. They're going to push. They're going to shove. They're going to call you names. You, you, you take it for what it is. Be strong mentally. You see, quality and quantity. It takes a lot of time to be able to tell your kids. And it is my opinion. I would never tell my boys. When you go in there and someone says something mean to you, you just you, you, you come and get for help or whatever. Listen to what is mean process it, teach them to process it, and figure it out. If it turns into some type of physical, arc, uh, physical altercation, you prepare them for that too. But most of the time, most of the time, it's just a mental thing. 
And this whole idea of triggered and safe zones, if I was given this message in 1985, 1975, people would laugh. Like, what are you talking about? But we have conditioned our boys to take it personal when the other third grader makes fun of their shoes. Is that bad? Yes. Do we want it to happen? No. Can we? You see what I'm saying. But it's a mental capacity, strength of mind, which means your kid may not be the six foot six uh, athlete. Doesn't matter. They can still have a strong mind. A strong mind has nothing to do with physical size. My older son's been through all kinds of training in the military, and some of the people that are hanging all together who finish all the graduations. They're five foot six, five foot seven, 175 pounds. It has nothing to do with strength. This strength is between the ears, and it can be conditioned. It can be raised up. Courage also comes. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is the moving forward and doing what is needed anyway. Boys all have different personalities. Some you'll have to train to be courageous to move past their fear. This is just a personality thing. Some personalities are just naturally more risk takers. Some are not, right? And so I've raised two boys. And when we were out doing different things, younger son is eight years younger than the older son. The older son's natural sense if he saw a log going across the river, pff, he's on the log, going across. You're kind of watching it. Worst case is broken arm, go ahead and go. Brady comes along. He sees his older brother doing it. He was a little bit more cautious, just a personality thing, a little bit more cautious, not going to immediately do it. And so I'd go up to him and say, hey, he can do it. You can do it. And it takes just a little bit of encouragement, a little bit. Of, yeah. And then all of a sudden, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, once he accomplishes it, Oh, okay, and it was cool. Older brothers over there championing them on. Sometimes he wouldn't champion them on. Sometimes he'd make fun of them, push them back in the water. All kinds of things happen between boys. But the reality is this. You may have a son who that's just their natural bent. They're just doing things naturally. Other ones, it's inside of them, but because of their personality, you're going to say, you know what? No, go ahead and do that. It's okay to do that. Okay, good. And this happened with ours. We're talking about like four and five years old. And so you condition them at a young age. It's okay to take some physical risk to swing from that, to jump from that. Some of you, especially some of you, maybe the single moms or moms didn't really, that just freaks you out. Listen, it's inside of them, and we got to burn out that energy, and we got to bring to the forefront who God created them to be so that when the testosterone hits at puberty, they know what to do with it and how they can move forward. And this enables them to be courageous. They desire to be courageous. It's built in by God. But again, our culture wants to devalue it. But it's in there. Listen, they're going to be men. And so as boys, it's in there. And you have to release it. And once you release it, and once you encourage it, it's an incredible thing because they need this sense of adventure. They need a sense of conquering. They need this sense. We see it all the time at summer camp. We take you little darlings to summer camp, especially the middle school boys, the younger ones. And we go up to the Bon Clark, and there's a, a big creek river-ish kind of thing with rocks and water. And every year, we'll have free time and I'm driving around the cart, and I'll hear a little screaming, yelling, whatever, and I'll look over, and about six or seven, usually sixth grade boys, first time they've kind of been on their own, they're all of them, the water up to about here, and they look up, and they give that, oh, we're in trouble. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Oh, Mr. Kenny, we're just in the river. We, we jumped from that rock, and they got sticks, and they just got all, right? And they, they think they're in trouble. And I'm like, hey, make sure you're, make sure you're at the turf for dinner. One kid one time said, we can just stay here and have fun in the creek? I was like, sure. You, your parents signed a medical release form. You're good. <laughs> but then I've talked to them. And all of a sudden, and I won't tell you any names, but over the years, my mom won't let me do this. My dad won't let us do it. Do what? It's just jumping from rock to rock and going in and sliding and getting muddy and all of those kinds of things. Now, some of you are thinking, my son doesn't like doing that. He likes to read books. He likes to be inside. Great. 
I've seen all types and all of them. There's something adventurous. Trust me, it's true. You can condition it away. Not my son. He just like, there's something there. Take them and let them be uh, courageous. Let them be, in a, in a sense, adventurous because from this comes a sense of conquering, a sense of adventure, and courage. Confidence comes from acts of courage, tempting hard things, accomplishing. Based on your son's age, give them hard things to do. The question of the heart of every teen boy, am I strong enough? Am I tough enough? Which is, if it's not taught properly, then this is why we see kids get into gangs and they get abusive, right? Because they're still trying to prove themselves. You can't take the proving out. You can just guide how the proving happens. And so these kids who are in gangs and they're beating up on people and doing all these horrible things, maybe with girls, whatever, they're still just trying to prove themselves. I'm a ninth grader. Am I tough enough? I'm a ninth grader. Am I strong enough? It's our job to guide it in the right direction. And it starts young, and you move up with them, helping them do hard, challenging things. The next one's the provider. We are to raise hardworking, responsible, and resourceful men. Again, to do, teach. One day, one day, you will be responsible for you, and then one day you're going to be responsible for a family if you choose to get married. If you choose to stay single, pff, high five, great. You're just responsible for you. If you get married, now you're responsible for your wife and any kids that come. When do you start teaching that? About age three. Why? You're going to condition them. You're going to raise them up. So by the time they're ninth grade, they know. There's no question if I choose to get married, I'm the protector. I'm the provider. Is there a sense of head back, shoulders up? That's who I am. You want that. You don't want these mousy little boys who are afraid to protect, afraid to provide. It's inside. We got to pull it out. God has created them. That's why men and women are different. That's what testosterone is all about, the aggression. You train the aggression. Proverbs 16, 26, it is good for workers to have an appetite. An empty stomach drives them on. Proverbs is awesome. It just says, why do I work? Here's one for you. You know why you work? This was, you heard me say this word. You don't work so you get your passions met. Well, I only work in my passion. That's awesome if you get a chance to do that. But sometimes, sometimes you work to put food on the table. And your passion is your kids' empty stomachs, your wives' empty stomach, the leaky roof, whatever it is. It'd be awesome. And it's awesome if we can work in our passions. Man, that, that's ideal. But there's sometimes it's not about the ideal. It's about provision. It's about being the provider. We talked about that last week. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Classic, Paul. Classic. As a Christian, we are to provide for our families. And if you don't, then you are denying the faith. This is how it ties in. What is the faith? You were raised to be the provider and the protector. You're a follower of Christ. If you choose not to do that, you're denying the faith, the one who created you and gave you this calling, this connection when the two become one. You've denied the faith. Which means, again, we're going to see it. You don't just get to do what you want to do. It's not about you. When do we start teaching our kids that? Very early. You can ask any one of my boys. We have the same conversation. This is not you and this is not the world. It's difficult. It's challenging. But we have to do it. Resourceful. Responsible, resourceful. A can-do attitude. Giving them things that are hard, giving them things where they have to figure it out. Problem-solving problem skills are key 
to be a, a provider. Problem solving skills. Give a task that all you give is the end goal. All you give is the end goal. I want you to do this. Here's this tool, here's this tool, go do it. Whatever it may be. And see if they can figure it out. And when they can't figure it out, maybe you gotta come in again. That goes back to the training. But you come in there and you're training. But you want those times where they're fully frustrated. I can think of multiple times with my older son. When we lived in the, in the house up here in Shannamara, I would give him something. It was ridiculous what I told him to do. And he would get so frustrated. I'm like, dude, figure it out. Figure it out. Fast forward it. He's now married, go figure, 26 years old. And he's having to be a husband. His military stuff that he's doing, he just told me this like a week ago. I was like, well, how'd that happen? You know, we just had to, I was like, oh, you just had to figure it out. He's got to figure it out. When we hire people here, it's one of the greatest things. Can you figure it out or you, do you quit? Figure it out. Building in that resourcefulness, not laziness. What did the Bible say about working hard? Let me just rip through these Proverbs real quick. The soul, Proverbs 13, the soul of a lazy one craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made prosperous. Proverbs 21, the desire of the lazy one kills him for his hands refuse to do labor. Proverbs 26, as the door turns on its hinges, so does a lazy one in his bed. A lazy one buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it up into his mouth. He turns in his bed. When he finally goes up to eat, he can't even, he's so lazy he won't even feed himself. Proverbs 19, laziness induces deep sleep and a lazy person will go hungry. Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. If you can work and you're a Christian, you work or you don't eat. We want to instill work and reward system early. Instill a work and reward system early because that's how the real world functions. You're like, I would never pay my kid to get grades. You can go back and forth on that. I'm just going to tell you, if they're not motivated by, some, by just getting a good grade, pay them. Absolutely. You know why? That's the way the real world works. Well, they should just want to get A's. Not all of them want to get A's. But a lot of them like money. And guess what? That's how the real world works. Now, you don't have to get good grades or I won't feed you. Whatever you want to do. But we need to build in work and reward system. I was talking to a dad yesterday. His son started his first job. His son told him, it is classic, his son told him, I'm not feeling too good today. I think I'm going to call in. The dad told me, this is what he told his son. Hey, listen, men don't call in sick. That's the way he raised them. You, know, you can't be sick. Listen, there's some jobs you don't get paid unless you don't go to work, unless you go to work. So maybe in corporate America, at all, there are some jobs you don't get paid if you don't go to work. And so there is this idea, back to mental t toughness. Yeah, at some point, got a little sniffle, it back hurts a little bit, still got to go to work. Some of you, again, that just triggered you, like, oh, no. You don't want to spread germs. It's funny that there's the, 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 the challenge of spreading germs is a whole lot more in corporate America than it is in blue-collar America. Because a lot of these folks, how I grew up, you, you don't work, you don't get paid. See, there's a toughness there. And that's what we want to instill into our boys the self-esteem movement of the late 80s, you've heard me say this, the early 90s failed miserably. We want our kids to be responsible adults. The training starts as early as they have the cognitive ability to make choices. Unfortunately, our culture in the late 80s started the self-esteem movement that, and the un unintended consequences was less motivated and lazy generation with no sense of responsibility. A healthy self-esteem, we were told by experts, 
would help kids perform better in school, work, and in life in general. By the early 90s, parents were flipping over backwards trying to help their kids feel good about themselves, no matter if they did something right or wrong, if their, good, if their grades were good or bad, if their conduct was good or bad, working or being lazy, trying hard or cheating. Nothing was as important as feeling good about yourself so that you had a, a healthy self-image or healthy self-esteem. Parents and teenagers were told kids and teens could not handle disappointment, failure, and being told no, and anything that did not make them feel instantly better about themselves should be avoided. I'm not even sure who thought that was a good idea, but they ran the gauntlet of tests in the, in the uh, late 80s, early, in all the 90s, and by the 2000s, now we have what we have. The whole self-esteem movement that everything is centered around how you feel. Remember, it's not about how you feel, it's about what's true. And sometimes what we feel, we need to do something different then so that we can be successful. The very things that builds character and develops responsibility is what was taken away in the self-esteem movement. Failure is no longer allowed. Everyone gets a trophy. We do it here all the time at Team Church Sports. You know who gets a trophy here? The team that wins the championship. We don't give everybody a trophy. Why? Because we're here to train. Now, we come up, we follow up, especially in this culture. We follow up. What's the reason why we do that? Well, you know what? Sometimes you're just not good enough. And sometimes you didn't practice hard enough. And that's okay. We'll get them next time. So it's very encouraging. But this whole idea of everybody gets good grades, everybody gets... It's just raised a whole culture. Nobody wants to work. No one wants to give everything they can and when it comes to being a man, what looks kind of okay in middle school and high school, then all of a sudden they get married and they have responsibilities. And guess what? The boss doesn't give a trophy for everybody. Not everybody gets a raise. You have to come to work or you get fired. But we've raised this whole thing. Hard work was no longer needed or aspired to because we're all equal. Now, we know philosophically with all these nations and all this kind of stuff, we know what system of governments doesn't work. If everything's equal, then you take away competition, you take away courageousness, you take away the sense of working hard. Kids could not be told they aren't good enough. Here's what you tell the girls, too, but we're talking about boys. Here's what you tell your boys. There's going to be somebody who's always bigger, faster, and stronger. Somebody's going to be smarter. Someone's going to have more money. You cannot be the best at everything. It's just not possible. But you can be the best that God's created you to be. I've had that conversation with hundreds of boys. I've had that conversation with my boys. You be the best you can be. You give the best effort you can give. You're not going to be like that or that. You know what? God didn't give you a mathematician brain, so your ACT scores weren't as high as everybody else. That was difficult to hear. That was a challenge. What are you going to do? You go be the best you that God created because God gave you that brain. He gave you that skill set, so you figure out what God's done for you. You figure out what God wants you to do, and then you go be great at that, and then you're successful, not only in God's eyes, but in our eyes. But this whole idea that you can be whatever you want to be, it's just not true. I saw this a couple of weeks ago. A girl who won the, um, the Miss America Beauty Contest is also a uh, graduate from the Air Force Academy as a pilot. And, and they were saying, that she just proves to all the girls you can do whatever you want to do. It's not true. There are a lot of girls that don't have that girl's brain. There are a lot of girls that don't have that girl's outward appearance. So to tell every girl, you can do that, it's just not true. So let's get away from you can do anything, and let's figure out for our boys what has God created you to do. And then you be good at that. And anything less than your best, you're denying the faith of the one who created you. You tell your kids that at a certain age? Absolutely. Absolutely. Last one's the lover. We're to raise selfless, humble, Christ-like men. You be like Christ. Biblical manhood is true heroic love. You love out of honor, duty, respect, and selflessness. 
When you get married, that's what you love out of, not because you got, didn't get, you got your needs met, because this happened. You love as Christ loved the church, Paul said last week, out of honor and duty, respect and selfishness and responsibility. Love like Jesus and moving towards unconditional love. Philippians chapter two. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, husbands, soon to be husbands, but also for the interest of others. Have this, oh, here it is. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We said it last week. The responsibility of the husband is to be the lover, which is like Christ. It's just to give your life for your family. If something goes bump in the night, you go and you defend until the death. And then we raise our boys to see their future mate that way also. Real men don't leave just because they're not getting their needs met. Real men don't leave when it just gets hard, when it's not fun anymore. Those of us who have been married, you get married, it's awesome. How many months is it before it's not fun all the time? Your needs aren't getting met all the time. The excitement, gone. I got to go to work. But that's not why we stay married. You get married out of sometimes out of romantic love. You stay married out of the commitment of a Christ-like love. Real men love like Christ. How does that start as a boy? You start telling them that as they get to be high school kids, you start teaching them that. It's how we show it. And this becomes a difficult thing for many of us to hear. Fatherless homes may be the greatest problem in troubled families. All the statistics are out of why communities are crumbling. There's no dads in homes. I was going to give you all the statistics. It made my stomach turn. You can Google it. The amount of kids being born in America today by a single mom. There's no marriage. It's out of control. And then we're raising, specifically today, boys without fathers, without engaged fathers. This is why we have young men. Again, they think they're cool. They're, they don't know how to really act. They don't know how to be selfless. They don't know how to be loyal. And so we want to make sure that we are teaching it and we're modeling it. Real men respect women and don't see them as objects. We're going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks. We're talking about all of sexuality and how we view people. But absolutely, when your boys start dating, when they, start, when they get to old enough to have the puberty and that kind of stuff, you start talking about, there's a difference between male and female, and then you're going to start talking about how you respect the other person, the, other, the, the female. You respect their body. You respect their women. They're not just objects for personal sexual gratification. All of this is the training of how do we treat women. And again, in our society, with all the social media and all the stuff, which just, it just gets worse and worse, faster and faster. You got to start earlier. You got to start earlier. We'll have more talks about that later. This is more specifically about being the, the husband, the lover, the protector, loving like Christ. But I can't love like Christ to this high school girl if I'm always liking her nude pictures. She shouldn't be sharing them, but you see what I'm saying. I can't love like Christ if as dads, we just kind of teach the physical thing. And so it's all encompassing, isn't it? Because who we're raising as young men will one day be the, the men who are entering into marriage relationships. 
So there's this underarching spiritual development, right? I told you that everything is there. But for today, I wanted to, to hit on those specifics because we have been raised. Our chainsaw of parenting hasn't been sharpened in this way. Boys are to be courageous and daring and adventurous and mentally strong. It's inside their DNA, and you have to pull it out. Now, I'm going to finish with this. Again, every boy is different. And if you have a son who does not like sports, doesn't want to hunt, doesn't want to fish or ride a motorcycle, this talk had nothing to do with that. You figure out who your son is, and then you figure out how they can be courageous and take risk and be adventurous and be strong in how God's wired them up. But I will say this. Don't just immediately go, well, that's just who they are. They don't really like. Many times, that's just what cultures told them. That's just how they've been conditioned. Help them see the, the other side. And many times, they'll just latch onto it. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. I pray, God, that you would use my words, your words, God, just to help us to sharpen our parenting tool when it comes to raising boys who will be men. We ask it in your name. Amen.